you have just published the Genesis Antarctica Trinity. Is this your first work? And uh, have you always enjoyed writing? Okay, well, um, it, it is my first work, and there again it isn't. However, that, um, this is part of the story as to how it got to be written. I, I always enjoyed writing when I was a, when I was sort of in my twenties. I would I would write loads of poems and and I was very much into radio plays. I think radio drama is is, is absolutely a fascinating medium because the because the scenery is so good. The scenery. The scenery because it's all in your head. Okay. <laughs> and and so um, so yes, I, I have always had a great uh, love of words. Right, so how did you come to write the Zandonatis books? Right, well now the Zandonatis books, uh, there's quite a long story actually in that. It, it's because, um, as I said, I, I started off writing poems and uh, things and various sorts of uh, pieces. But then I went through a phase of painting. Huh. And, and, and I was painting works which were, shall we say, visionary. Um, symbolic and very much influenced by the uh, by the pre-Raphaelites and, and by and by painters like Dali, Salvador Dali, mm -hmm. and um, and actually uh, I was working in in the, in the late nineteen sixties and the early seventies. I was actually working in a West End theatre. Ah, intriguing. How did you manage to get? Um into the theatre. Well, it was a, it was a, a friend of mine. I I'd, I'd, I'd actually started off in in advertising, and um, but then because of my writing, I wrote a play and I sent it off to a to a regional um, uh, repertory company in Hornchurch, and um, and they said, well, they said this could be interesting, but it might be an idea if you had some experience in theatre. Mm -hmm. You can, if you would like, we you could come and work with us as an assistant stage manager. Okay. And now, an assistant stage manager, somebody is a general dog's body. I mean, you could be, you could be making properties one for one show. The next show, you might have a, a walk-on part and say, "Madam, your carriage awaits." You know, or you could be doing lighting or sound or whatever. And um, uh, and then a friend of mine who was working in this theatre in London, called at the time the Strand, it's now the Novello, mm -hmm. very, near, um, very near Covent Garden. Right. And so I was working there as an electrician, um, which, which is a joke. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know my you know, live cable from my neutral. <laughs> but uh, it so happened that I, for some reason or other, I was able to operate the lighting board rather well. In those days it wasn't all automated. Okay. And uh, so I was able to program it and, uh, and so they, they kept me on for that. And, um, and after I'd been there a couple of years and I'd been doing painting at home, I found this room at the top of the theatre uh, which people had almost forgotten about and, and I went to the manager and I said, hey could I uh, possibly use that room uh, for my paintings, because we, we, in the theatre we worked in the morning uh, and did maintenance, in the evening there was a show, but in the, in the afternoon there was all that time, you know, when one could do something else. And so he said, well, yeah, he said, well, look, I'll tell you what, he said, you can have it rent-free, provided you, you do it up a bit, you paint it, up, paint it up a bit, because it was in a bit of a state. So fine, right. and it was, it was fantastic, it was like uh, four metres high, and uh, skylight, and um, and it was ideal. Ideal for an illusionist painter. As an illusionist painter, yeah. And, <laughs> and actually, the illusion worked quite well, <laughs> um, because uh, because being there, um, they the, the artists who are in, in the shows and the impresarios, they would come up to my to my uh, studio, right. And so, and I could say, like to uh, you know, an actress, I would say, "Would you like to come up and see my <laughs> paintings?" And I actually had some. <laughs> and and so, and I was and I was exhibiting in a in a in a west in a smart gallery near Bond Street, and um, and then one day, 
I happened to go to a gallery in, um, in near St Paul's Cathedral where there was a painter uh, exhibiting his work. His name was Joffre, Joffre Boschart. He was Dutch and he, the kind of work he did was something which really, really sort of touched my soul. And he was one of the, he and his wife were, were two of the founder members of, of a movement uh, called the Meta-Realists. Mm -hmm. And he had the technique, both of them had the technique of Salvador Dali. Uh, or the Dutch masters. Okay. Except that what they did was not sort of random. It was highly symbolic. And everything meant something. And, and I was completely, completely smitten by this. And, and did you actually meet them? Yeah, it, it so happened. I don't believe in chance, by the way, but anyway. Mm. Um, it so happened that when I went into the gallery, they were there. They, in fact, I, I bought a, a, a signed print. You know, I couldn't afford the paintings, but I could afford a signed print. And, uh, and so I met them, and I told them that I was also a painter, and, and it turned out that they were staying at the Waldorf Astoria, which was like maybe, I don't know, uh, 25 yards from where my studio was. Coincidence? Coincidence. So, um, they came up and they saw, and, and immediately Joffre came into the studio. He said, oh, what a wonderful light. Mm. And, um, and anyway, I showed them what I was doing. And Ellen, Ellen Lorian, uh, she said to me, well, would you like to come and spend a week with us in the south of France? And I, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I went. And, and they, were, they were living at that time in a little sort of shack on the, on the edge of a cliff, literally. Huh. There was, a, there was the, the, the little cabin, there was just room for Joffre to have his studio and paint and, and sleep. And Ellen slept uh, well, in, the, in the, the front part of the... it was two rooms. Mm -hmm. And I was... so I, I slept in the tent outside. Right. But it was, it was, it was actually a life-changing experience. In what way? <laughs> because I wanted to paint like them. Yeah, okay. And I realised that I was missing 10 or 15 years of, of art school training. Mm. So, the lot, it didn't happen overnight, but I decided, in the end, to paint with words rather than paints and brushes. Okay, so that, in fact, discouraged you from painting, from continuing to paint. It was discouraged. It's just that I couldn't meet my own standards, mm. and I'd always I I, the, I I wrote before I painted it anyway, and and so but but then that made me think. Well, look, they they have they they have painted everything I would like to paint. So you know it's been done, but I would like to write something that that would have the same intensity, mm -hmm. and that was how in 1974. The original version of Zandonatis got written, and I, by a sheer chance, uh, <laughs> I have it here. This is the this is the manuscript. Which at the time uh, was all written using a typewriter, so when you wanted to change a word, you had to retype the entire page. No word processing in those days. No. And so this was a, a long, long story based, at that time, based on the discovery of a series of urns underneath the Antarctic ice. This, these were discovered in 1962. And among the, uh, among the documents contained in the urns was... Um, was this epic poem called The Song of Gorin, mm. and this was the foundation for this entire saga. So can you tell us a little more about The Song of Gorin? Indeed, the, the Song of Gorin is an epic quest. Um, and and it, is, it is a quest that, um, that like Joffre's painting, and like the kind of painting I've been doing, is full of archetypes. Mm -hmm. And all these archetypes uh, come together to create a story of their own. 
and which people can interpret as they want. Um, so the Song of Gorin t tells the story of, uh, of somebody who wakes up in the middle of what, is, what we discover is the Paradise Garden mm -hmm. uh, without knowing anything about himself except his name, which is Gorin. And so he has no recollection of uh, life before that? No, absolutely nothing. Completely clean slate. Okay. And so the, 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 the Song of Gorin, is, the saga, is, is, how he, is how he discovers his purpose mm -hmm. and how he uh, turns out to have a very crucial role to play in the story of this uh, known as Golden City, Zandanatis, uh, and the people who had created it, those who lived there, and, uh, and in fact, the origins of humanity uh, were, were laid down at this time, and he played a crucial role in making them what they, are, what they were, and making us what we are. So, um... These um, ancient manuscripts, these documents, were found under the ice? Yeah, by a, an expedition that left from Wilkes Base uh, in Antarctica in 1962. And they first of all went to the abandoned Russian ba base of Vostok, which in recent years, by the way, is where they have found an underwater lake uh, very deep under the ice. But they had a secret agenda, and that was to go on towards the Hark on the Seventh Plateau uh, because um, there had been fossils uh, discovered there, fossils of, uh, of trees, of, of leaves, and things which demonstrated that Antarctica at one time was in more temperate uh, waters. Further north, I, I Further presume. North. Right. And, um, and so they... And their secret agenda was to was to go and see if they could find anything more concrete. Mm -hmm. And did they? And uh, they 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 discovered these urns. Um, uh, the only thing was that it was by accident. They had loads of very expensive equipment with them, mm -hmm. um, but it so happened, rather stupidly, uh, one of their people uh, was going out to find um, to to get some snow to melt down for for, 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 for drinking, drinking water. For drinking water. And he fell through the ice, and 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 he was and he um, he uh, landed on a ledge, which stopped him sort of plummeting into the abyss. Mm. And um, uh, and then they, you know, then they went down and investigated, and they found these this this series of urns, uh, which and there were about uh, um, there were there were twenty 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 two or twenty three, um, and. The documents describe uh, a civilization that existed at the time. Can you tell us a little more about that society? Right. Well, this this the, 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 it tells the story of this this city, Zandanatis, and um, and these documents are um, of different types. What is very interesting is that um, there are there there are mainly most of them are things like decrees. Uh, speeches made by kings, um, administrative documents, and things like that. A lot of it was, in fact, they were they were pretty boring. Mm. But there were um, these two epic sagas. There was there was the Song of Gorin, uh, the story that, uh, that formed the basis of Zandernatis and the now Genesis Antarctica. And there was also another one called the Song of the Heroes, which recounted some of the heroic um, quests and and, and uh, events. Of, that went on, um, and curiously, uh, there were no documents that reflected in any way to religion of any kind. Um, which is uh, well, as far as I know, and as far as the experts that we, we've worked with know, it means it would be the only society of which we have any record uh, which did not have any religion because they didn't need any religion. So does that mean they were atheists? No, they weren't atheists, but they didn't, um, they didn't need to seek for God, or a God, or at least a God, but I mean a, um, 
a re the, uh, the laws by which uh, the world or the universe was 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 operated. Um, uh, they they had a great understanding of them inherently, mm -hmm. and so they didn't need to placate any gods um, uh, when things were going bad. And what really is the crucial point of all this is that um, they were not afraid of death. Why is that? Because they had tot total recall of all their previous existences. You mean they believed in reincarnation? They didn't believe in it, actually. They knew it to be a fact of life. Ah. And so uh, this meant that they... Um, that, that um, when they started getting old, you know, they realised it was, it was time to, well, you know, to trade in the body, to, to trade in the ageing body for a new one. And, uh, and they were invariably um, having festivals because, or celebrations because they would remember, you, you were my, you know, two, two guys could, could meet up and say, hey, you were, you, you were my sister three, three, three lives ago. Ah, so they... They believed you could be born again more than once. Oh yes, oh yes, they were many times, many, many times, hundreds of times. Uh, and, the, 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 and you just worked on, you, you know, each life you had a certain thing to accomplish and, uh, and you could build on it. And you could, so, so it, it became a sum of, of, uh, of their experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, well, let, let's say, it, well, it made them, it gave them greater understanding. Uh, and uh, instead of just sort of thinking, you know, you only live once. I mean, if I, I always, I always thought anyway that that expression, you only live once, is one of the most stupid uh, uh, phrases that man has ever invented because it, uh, because it seems to be absolutely obvious that that would be cruelly unjust apart from anything else. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so they, they, were, they knew this to be a fact. And... Uh, and so they didn't need they didn't need to put, to to placate or, or or worship or or pray to anybody. Is this why there's so much resistance to the story um, being published uh, in in this form? Well, uh, it, it's certainly true that that, uh, that that people in the church uh, and people in other religions do not like uh, this kind of thing because because religion with only one God and only live once kind of concept, um, it means that the church or the church or the religious, the, the religious order or whatever um, has a, what shall we say, has, a, um, has an exclusive on truth. Mm. And if you don't do what I tell you to do, you'll go to the hot place. Mm. So you'd better do as you're told. And uh, and some and and the idea uh, and the idea of reincarnation. Okay, at present, um, reincarnation is it's quite easy for them to for them to, to to put it to one side and say this is this is just stupid. It's and it's not in the Bible and mm -hmm. all this sort of thing. Apart from the fact that there are several mentions of it in the Bible. Anyway, um, but with this kind of scientific backing. Um, there are many people, many, many conventional, conservative religious people who don't like this book at all and, and did a great deal to prevent it from being published. Right. Well, I think uh, that concludes our interview this evening. <laughs> thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you. And thank you for this, having this opportunity to, to talk about it uh, uh, in your program. And... Uh, uh, this well. is the story of the pre-glacial civilization where our legends were born. Of a perfect paradise where everyone had total past life recall. Of a people needing no religion, only independence from father-mother demigods. This is the story of what we call the Fall of Man. This is Zandonatis. And now, a trinity three in one Genesis and Arctica. Retelling the epic Song of Gorin, written when legends were born. 
backed by compelling corroborative evidence, background documents, past life memory research programs, the cover-up, and much, much more. These authenticated revelations are as real as you need them to be. Fabulous facts or fabulous fable. Where do you draw the line?